uh, space groups today. So yesterday we talked about crystal systems, and this morning I posted an updated uh, lecture notes for crystal system uh, containing the filled out tables uh, for you. Uh, today we'll be starting on space groups and how do we uh, assign space groups to crystal systems and interpret the symbols for space groups. So we'll go ahead and get started with that today. And so when we're talking about space groups, we're talking about combinations of symmetry elements. And so when we have a particular symmetry element, we can actually get multiple types of that element through translation. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at a mirror plane perpendicular to B. So here, if this is the origin right here, we have a mirror plane perpendicular to B right here. And if we translate one unit along A, we have another mirror plane perpendicular to A. But what happens in the process is there's also a mirror plane perpendicular to A in between the two at zero and A. So we get this additional symmetry that shows up when we start translating symmetry operators. So there's a mirror plane at zero, zero, and then there's a mirror plane at a half zero if A is the x-axis and B is the y-axis. And so this extra symmetry element occurs because of the translation. When we translate a symmetry element, we generate more symmetry elements. Likewise, if we go in the opposite direction, we translate negative one. Again, at negative one, we get the symmetry element just like we did at one, but between zero and negative one, there's also another symmetry element that appears at negative a half. And so again, by translating symmetry elements, you generate even more symmetry elements. So when we're looking at space group diagrams, you may see a mirror plane at the origin, but you also may see another mirror plane in the middle of the uh, unit cell. So this is what we're referring to. So when we combine symmetry elements, here we're looking at a two-fold rotation parallel to B. So at the origin again, the origin dictated right here, we have a two-fold rotation. So we rotate about the B axis. This rotates here. And then if we translate that along the A, Again, we see another two-fold here where we rotate 180 degrees, we generate the other coordinate. Likewise, if we translate down one along the C-axis, we have another two-fold rotation and we generate the other corresponding position. Now, if we translate one across A and run one across C, we get this two-fold rotation right here. So this is just by translation. These are the different uh, points on the unit cell, if you want to call them that, that have this two-fold axis. Now what happens by translating, then we generate even more two-fold rotations. So as we translate across A, you see that in the middle at a half along A, we also generate a two-fold rotation. So what happens is this position here, as we go across, if we do a two-fold on this position, it forms this position. So we generate two-fold rotation. Oh, excuse me, not that position, my bad. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So we do a two-fold rotation, we get this position. Now these two-fold rotations here are additional symmetry that's generated from the translation of the original 
two-fold rotation. Likewise, as we go down the C-axis, we generate additional two-fold rotation. So here, if we have this position here, we go through this two-fold, we generate this position. So the, the, the main thing to notice here is that when you translate symmetry elements, you generate additional places where that symmetry element occurs. And if you've looked at the Mercury assignment, you'll notice that you'll see symmetry elements, not just at the origin, but in the middle of the unit cell, et cetera. Likewise, with uh, screw axes, we have a rotation followed by a translation. So here, if we take a look, and this is parallel to B, so we have position one. We rotated 180 degrees, and then we translate. So we rotate this, it comes up, and then we translate a half unit across two. Hold on. And then if we translate to the next unit cell, again, we do a rotation. And then we do a translation. So we get four. But likewise, we can also do a rotation about this screw axis. So if we rotate this two prime, 180 degrees, and translate a half unit, we get three. So there's a screw axis right here. And then we also generate additional screw axes in the middle of the unit cell. So at the origin, we have the screw axis of rotation and translation. And then we also, if we were to put a screw axis along the middle of the unit cell, we get a rotation and translation, we get two prime. So again, we generate additional uh, types of symmetry. So there's a screw axis at the origin, and then there's a screw axis at, in this case, zero, zero, a half. Now we're talking about, now we're switching gears and we're talking about how we can combine symmetry elements to generate other symmetry elements. And this is important because when we talk about space groups, in the space groups, we only, we're only given the shorthand notation for space groups. From the shorthand, we have to elaborate and get the longhand form. And to do that, you have to combine symmetry elements. So for example here, if we have the intersection of two orthogonal mirror planes, it generates a two-fold rotational axis. And so if we look at the bottom, if we take our XYZ coordinates, perform a mirror plane perpendicular to A, X becomes negative, and then on that set of coordinates we do another mirror plane which is perpendicular to B, we get this final set of coordinates. Now this is the same as doing a two-fold parallel to C. So when you combine two perpendicular mirror planes, it's going to be the same as a two-fold par parallel to the other axis that wasn't included. So if we, for example, did a mirror plane perpendicular to B, and then we did a mirror plane perpendicular to A, or let's say C, not A. So mirror plane perpendicular to A, not A, why do I keep on putting A? Let's see. So doing these two 
operations is the same as doing a twofold parallel to A. So when you combine two mirror planes, you generate a twofold rotation on the third axis that wasn't involved in either of the mirror planes. So we did a, if you do a mirror plane perpendicular to B, then a mirror plane perpendicular to C, it's the same as just doing a twofold parallel to A. So this is one combination. So two mirror planes generate a twofold rotation. Now, if we look and let's say we want to know what happens when we take a twofold rotation and then perform a mirror plane perpendicular to that axis. So if we take a twofold parallel to B, so we have our initial set of coordinates. We do a twofold parallel to B, which means X and Z become negative. And then on that set of coordinates, we do a mirror plane perpendicular to B. You see that what we generate, and let me move this so you can see it, is an inversion center. So when you have a twofold parallel to an axis, and then followed by a mirror plane perpendicular to that axis, you're going to generate an inversion center, and this inversion center will be at the origin. So for example, if we had a twofold parallel to A, followed by a mirror plane perpendicular to A. This is the same as an inversion center. So again, the, the rotation, the, the, the axis about the rotation, the mirror plane needs to be perpendicular to that. It can't be, for example, we can't do a two-fold parallel to A and then a mirror plane perpendicular to B, this would not result in an inversion center. So it has to be a twofold parallel to an axis and then followed by a mirror plane perpendicular to that axis. That's how we generate an inversion center. Now it can even include, as we'll see in a little bit, it can include space symmetry as well. So when you use just a rotation and a mirror plane, you generate an inversion center on the origin. However, when you include, say for example, we do a two sub one parallel to B, and then we do a mirror a glide plane, say an A glide perpendicular to B, this will also generate and inversion center. However, the center will not be on the origin. The center will be off the origin because now we've introduced space symmetry in it. So we have translation in addition to uh, symmetry or rotational and reflection symmetry, point symmetry. So again, you have a rotation and you have a mirror plane perpendicular to that axis of rotation, you're going to generate an inversion center. So we talked about two mirror planes. If you have two perpendicular mirror planes, it's going to generate a rotation parallel to the third axis. If you have a rotation and you have a mirror plane perpendicular to that axis of rotation, you're going to generate an inversion center. And this one right here is very important because this is how we're going to identify which space groups are central symmetric by seeing which ones contain a rotation and a mirror plane perpendicular to that rotation. Because that tells us there's an inversion center observed. So here is just uh, what I showed you on the previous slide. We take a screw axis and a glide plane. So the screw axis is parallel along a particular axis, and then we have a glide plane perpendicular to that axis. You, you notice that we still get the inversion center, 
However, the center of that inversion is no longer on the origin. It's at a zero, a fourth, a fourth. And the way you find the center of the inversion center is, so since it's negative x, negative y plus a half, negative z plus a half, well, x is still zero for the inversion center, but you take the half and a half and you divide it by two, you get one fourth, one fourth. And so when you have a screw axis followed by a glide plane, you generate an inversion center. However, that inversion center is no longer on the origin. And if you were to look here, the inversion center on this diagram would be right here because this is at zero a quarter quarter so that's where the inversion center is and if you yeah okay so again a glide plane excuse me, a screw axis followed by a glide plane perpendicular to that axis also generates an inversion center. The only difference is the center is shifted off the origin. Now you may say, well, you know, like we talked about uh, last time, a two-fold roto inversion is the same thing as a mirror plane, so that's why we don't do a two-fold roto inversion because it's the same thing as a mirror plane perpendicular to that axis. Now you may say, well, why don't we have a glide plane that can be perpendicular to the same axis? So for example, a B glide perpendicular to B. And when you do a B glide perpendicular to B, what you get is a very similar to a mirror plane perpendicular to B, the only difference is that the mirror plane has been shifted off the origin. So if we had a mirror plane perpendicular to B, we could shift the, the, the coordinates of that mirror plane to make it identical to a B glide perpendicular to B. So that's why we don't have uh, glide planes perpendicular to the same axis as the translation because it's the same thing as a mirror plane that's just been translated off the origin. So you'll never see an A-glide perpendicular to A or a B-glide perpendicular to B or a C-glide uh, perpendicular to C. So there are lots of combinations for uh, space groups and we're only can, uh, uh, interested in the ones that can fill space in three dimensions. And so from that, we generate about, well not about, there's 230 different combinations of symmetry elements that give unique space groups. Now don't worry, out of this 230, you'll be shocked, but we only use about five of them. So <laughs> some of them I've never even encountered in my entire life, especially when you get above 100, very rarely, do you ever encounter one of those? And so you can list all the symmetry elements present in some of these space groups, but as you can see from the first bullet, there are some of these space groups have about 192 different symmetry elements in just one space group. So that means you have to write 192 different symmetry elements just to get all the space group, or all the operators in that space group. So what we're going to do is we're going to group the space filling symmetry elements into a symbol that contains the information we need. So what do we need? We need the symmetry elements and we need the crystallographic direction because for different crystal systems, there are different axes that are the main or major axis. And we'll talk about that as well. So we're going to kind of condense down the symmetry elements into a shorthand version so that we don't have to see all 192 symmetry operators, for example, we see a shorthand version where we can extract all that information from it. So, 
So the how do we get to space groups and their symbols? Now this is very important. The space group will consist of the lattice type, which is, you know, it's going to be either primitive, side center, body centered, or face centered. So that's what we mean by lattice type. Is there any centering in the space group? Then it's going to be followed by the symmetry along the three unique symmetry directions. So you're always going to have a capital letter to begin with, and again, that signifies the uh, type of centering present. So again, there's four types, primitive, side centering, which is generally C centering, body centering, which is I, the symbol I, and face centering, which is the symbol F. That's the first thing you're always going to see. Now, after that, you're going to see, for example, rotation axes, which are set along a particular direction, mirror operations, which means they're perpendicular to that specific direction. And then when you have a rotation and a mirror operation that are on the same axis, for example, a twofold parallel to B followed by a mirror plane perpendicular to B, the way we separate them is by a slash. So for example, two upon M down here, this could mean it's a twofold parallel to B and then a mirror plane perpendicular to B. So if we look at some of these, and I'll just look at one or two because we're going to get more involved in this in the future slides. But here we have P, N, M, A. So P means it's primitive. N is a glide plane, and since it's the first one and there's three of them, this represents the a axis for orthorhombic. So that's why you know this is an in glide perpendicular to A. And the way I know it's A first because in the orthorhombic system, as we'll see, the first axis is always the A axis. Then it's going to be the B axis for orthorhombic. So this is a mirror plane perpendicular to B. And then the last important axis for orthorhombic is C. And so this is an A-glide perpendicular to C. In addition to that, every space group, the first symmetry element is always the identity element. Now you see, just from this notation, we have extracted four symmetry elements from it. But in fact, as, as we'll find out later, there are actually eight symmetry elements total. And the way you get the other uh, was it four elements is by combining the different elements. So if you take an inglide perpendicular to A and then a, B, a mirror plane perpendicular to B, what do you get? When you take a mirror plane perpendicular to B and an A-glide perpendicular to C, what's the resulting operator? So by combining those three uh, different types of reflections and glide planes, you generate the other four uh, operators, which we'll do in just a moment. Now if we look at, for example, P21 upon C, this is a monoclinic space group. And the way we know it's monoclinic is because it only has one unique axis and it has a two-fold rotation in it. And so when you have a monoclinic, the primary axis for a monoclinic system is the B axis. So if we extract this information, again, P means primitive. The 2 sub 1 means that we have a 2 sub 1 parallel to B. And then slash means that the C is on the same axis. So now we have a C glide perpendicular to B. And of course, we always have the identity as well. So in monoclinic, we have in this space group, we actually have four symmetry operators. So the way we generate the last operators by combining the screw axis followed by a glide plane. So if you just remember in the previous slide, when we take a screw axis, 
and then perform a glide plane, what do we get? We get an inversion center. So P21 upon C has these four symmetry elements. Now this inversion center will be off the origin because we're taking a screw axis and a glide plane. So P21 upon C would be called a, a centrosymmetric space group. So let's just kind of introduce you to how do you interpret the symbols on space groups. So we like to write the shorthand notation as compared to the long form. So the shorthand notation only gives you the minimum amount of symmetry you need to derive the rest of the uh, symmetry elements. The long form, which you won't find unless you look it up in a uh, table of crystallographic uh, symmetry operators, long form shows you all the symmetry for each unique direction. Now bear in mind that you will need to also still combine these to get even more symmetry because in the long form it shows most of them but not all the symmetry operators. So you remember we, we looked at PNMA and we said for PMNA we had the identity, we had an N glide perpendicular to A. We had an M glide perpendicular to B and an A glide perpendicular to C. Now, when we look at the long form, we notice that in addition to the glide planes, you see that we have screw axes. And so here, if we take a uh, the first one, it means it's a 2 sub 1 parallel to A. The second one is a 2 sub 1 parallel to B. And the third one is a 2 sub 1 parallel to C. So in the long form, we get the screw axes as well. Now, the, what's the issue here is how do we go from the short form and find these two sub ones? So now let's say we take a mirror plane, or let me let me back it up here a little bit. So this is the important part. How do we get those screw axes from the short form? So we start with the coordinates x, y, and z we perform a mirror plane perpendicular to B. I don't know how to let's say mirror plane perpendicular to B. And then we're going to do an A glide perpendicular to C. So first what we're going to do is we're going to perform a mirror plane perpendicular to B and then we're going to perform an A glide perpendicular to C and if you remember from what we just covered when you have two mirror planes or two glide planes the resulting operation will be a twofold or if you use glide planes a two sub one parallel to the third axis that is not shown. So when we get to our final set of coordinates, this should be a 2 sub 1 parallel to A. And the way I know it's a 2 sub 1 versus a twofold is because we have glide planes. So anytime at least one of your mirror planes is a glide plane, the resulting is going to be a screw axis. Now, if they're all mirror planes, the result would be the twofold. So now if we come here, we do a mirror plane perpendicular to B. This becomes X negative Y Z. Then we want to, on that set of coordinates, we want to do an A glide 
perpendicular to C. So A glide means we're going to translate along the X A direction one half. Y doesn't change and then Z becomes negative. And as you see, this is the operator for a two sub one parallel to A. So that's how they generate these two sub ones from the shorthand is they combine the different mirror planes and glide planes to get the resulting uh, screw axis. So that's how they generate each screw axis for this. Now if we want to look at the next one. So two sub one parallel to B. Oh no, undo. So let me just show you how to get the two sub one parallel to B. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with an in glide perpendicular to A, and then an A glide perpendicular to C. And this will give us the two sub one parallel to B because again B is not one of the axes in the glide plane or either glide plane. So now if we look here in glide perpendicular to A means A becomes negative and we add a half to Y and to Z. So that's the first set of co co coordinates. We just put it right there. So when we do an in glide perpendicular to A, this is the resulting coordinates, and now we're going to do an A glide perpendicular to C. So we have A glide perpendicular to C means we add a half to A, so 0.5 minus X. Nothing changes for Y. And then for Z or C, since it's perpendicular to C, it would become minus Z. Now, the negative 0.5 minus Z is the same as just saying 0.5 minus Z, because all we've done is translated it one unit. And so as you see here, this is still a two sub one parallel to B because both X and Z are negative and we translate along Y. The only difference is this screw axis is located, its center of the screw axis is located off the origin. But it's still a screw axis because you have negative X and negative Z. And then Y is still positive and we translate. So that's how you get the two sub one parallel to B. All right. Now uh, we're still missing one symmetry operator because remember I said there were a total of eight and if you count we only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're still missing one symmetry operator. And from the shorthand, the way we get that is we're going to take a set of coordinates and we're going to, to perform all three reflection and glide planes. So what are we going to do first? We're going to do a mirror plane perpendicular to A. No, it's not mirror plane. Glide plane 
Inglad perpendicular to A, my, my bad. An Mglad perpendicular to B. And a A Glad perpendicular to C. And we're going to see what symmetry operator results. So N glide perpendicular to A means A X becomes negative and we add a half to Y and a half to Z. Now we perform the next one, mirror plane perpendicular to B. X stays the same. Now negative 0.5 minus Y is the same as just saying 0.5 minus Y. And then Z stays the same. And then we have an A-glide perpendicular to C. So A me A-glide perpendicular to C means we add a half to the X. And again, we just say 0.5 minus X. No change in Y. It's 0.5 minus Y. And then we have perpendicular to C. So negative 0.5 minus Z is the same thing as saying 0.5 minus Z. And so when you look at it, you see that we have negative X, negative Y, negative Z. And this results in a inversion center. Now this inversion center is unique because the center of it is at a quarter, quarter, quarter. And so the last symmetry operator for this is an inversion center. And those are the eight operators for this space group. And PNMA is, since it has an inversion center, would be centrosymmetric. I'll give you just a moment to kind of look over this. So again, you're going to have to be able to take the take the shorthand and generate all the different symmetry operators. Now. Uh, when you generate these symmetry operators, and you, if you want to compare them to the handbook of crystallography values, don't be alarmed if you know they're a little bit off. So, like, if you find the center of your inversion center, and it was a little bit different from the book, as long as you have an inversion center, that's fine. Because sometimes they shift the symmetry elements a particular way. So, as long as you have the actual core elements it's okay so now we're going to talk about interpreting these symbols and how do we how based on the space group we can identify which crystal system it's from some of them are easier uh, than others So we talked about the short form, which usually has one to three components. And the long form always has three components along the three unique directions. And we're going to talk about the unique directions in just a moment. But from the space group, we should be able to get the crystal system, the centering, the symmetry, and also if there's inversion symmetry. And we'll talk about what are some of the key characteristics that, uh, that kind of support an inversion center. So for example, one key characteristic of a space group that would support having an inversion center is if you have three mirror planes perpendicular to three axes. Just like in PNMA, we have either glide plane or mirror plane perpendicular to each axis. When you have a condition like that, that's always going to generate an inversion center. So we'll talk about that as well. And there are 230 space groups. As you go higher up, we call them higher symmetry, meaning they have more symmetry elements associated with them. So here's a kind of a breakdown of the type of centering 
and the primary positions of the axes for the different crystal systems. So for triclinic, it can only be primitive and there's only two space groups and the triclinic is going to be either P1, which is space group number one, or P1 bar, which is space group number two. And P1 bar, since it has an inversion center, is a central symmetric space group. So for triclinic, it's either going to be P1 or P1 bar. You can't really go wrong with triclinic. Now with monoclinic, we can have two types of centering. We can have P primitive or side centering, C centering. The primary position, and this is important, so all symmetry operators for a monoclinic system are about the B axis. So over here we have CM. What that means is C means it's C centered. And M means there's a mirror plane perpendicular to B. Because monoclinic, the, the unique axis is always B. So if we were to draw the symmetry uh, elements in this, uh, what's it called, t -t 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 space group, there are actually, there's going to be four. So for CM, there's going to be four operators. And so, of course, there's the identity and there's a mirror plane perpendicular to B. So how do we get four from two? So we're going to show you. So what do we do? We start with the identity. So our first one, we have X comma Y comma Z. That's the identity operator. Next, we have a mirror plane perpendicular to B. So we have X negative Y Z. So now here we have to pay close attention. Since this is C centering, we also have a third identity matrix at X, or excuse me, X plus a half, Y plus a half, C. Because remember we talked about centering yesterday. When you have C centering, you got to add a half to X and Y. And now it becomes C center. So just like we have the identity at the origin, we also have an identity at a C centered origin. So that's number three. And then what we do is we perform a mirror plane perpendicular to B on this new C centered origin, and we get the fourth thing. So we'll say point half, point five minus y, z. And so these are the four symmetry operators for CM. So like I said, a C centered, as we discussed yesterday, has two lattice points. So each lattice point has its own origin. And then you also have to do the symmetry element for each lattice point as well. Just like I centered, F centered, they're going to have more lattice points. They're going to have more symmetry operators. Now with orthorhombic, we can have P primitive, C centering, I centering, F centering. But in addition to C centering, you can see A centering and B centering. Now with uh, orthorhombic, the primary position is A, secondary is B, and tertiary is C. So whenever you see orthorhombic space group, it's going to have three operators in it. The first one refers to the A axis, the second one the B axis, and the third one is the C axis. And so orthorhombic, the way you know it's orthorhombic, it only has two-fold symmetry and it has three unique axes. Now tetragonal, it can be either primitive or body centered, and we explained uh, on the last lecture why it can only be these two. The primary axis is C, 
the secondary axis is A slash B because remember A and B have the same uh, axis lengths. And the tertiary position is this one called 110, and I'll show you what that is in just a moment. So an example is I4 upon 1, which means you have a body-centered space group, and the uh, operator is a force of 1 parallel to C. And this one would have eight different operators because you're going to have four unique lattice point origins, and each one of those has a force of one parallel to C. Trigonal, trigonal is either primitive, and if in the rare case it's rhombohedral, it would be R-centered. And the primary position is C, the secondary is A, B, and then the tertiary is these uh, kind of odd uh, directions. And I'll show you what these odd directions are in just a second. So trigonal is P3, 2, means there's a threefold parallel to C, and then a twofold parallel to A or B or NB. Hexagonal can only be primitive. The unique axis is C. And it's very similar to trigonal as far as the secondary and tertiary axis. And so this one, P6 upon 5, means there's a it's primitive and it has a 6 of 5 screw axis parallel to the C axis. And then lastly, cubic can be primitive, body-centered, or face-centered. All three axes are the primary axes, and then the secondary and tertiary axes are these odd looking directions here so f2 upon f23 means it's face centered as a twofold parallel to the main axes and then a threefold parallel to this one 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 so just to give you an idea of these directions so when we say the a axis that's referring to the one zero zero the vector or the what we call a plane the b axis is referred to as zero one zero we'll talk more about these planes later on the c axis is referred to as zero zero one so when you see the a and the c and the b listed we're actually referring to these types of, of planes now, when you get to like the 110, the 120, et cetera, these are a little bit hard to visualize. And so the 110 is something like this, the shaded blue region you see here. Now, the 100 would be along the x-axis, so the A1. The 010 would be along just the A2 axis, which is the B axis. And the 001 would be along the A3 axis, which is the C axis. But the 110 looks like this direction here. The 111 is this direction or this plane. And again, when we talk about what's called Miller indices, we'll go more in depth on these types of directions. And then, of course, the 1, negative 1, 0 looks like this. So it's very important to know the primary axes for the different crystal systems for all the crystal systems but for the for monoclinic and orthorhombic you should know the secondary and tertiary positions for orthorhombic but for the other ones it's just mainly important to know the primary symmetry direction so on that note we'll stop for today i got a Stop a little earlier today. Have a meeting coming up, and we'll pick up with um, on tomorrow's lecture, looking at how we can describe some key characteristics when we're looking at space groups and assigning in them to crystal systems. So each one has some key characteristics that we can use to make it easier for us to assign uh, space groups to crystal systems. So on that note, I'll stop the lecture, and we'll pick up uh, here on. Uh, Friday tomorrow and we'll continue but if you have any questions I can take those now if you want to uh, put in the chat box or uh, want to unmute so, uh, 
just one thing like okay. yeah yesterday's lecture should be posted I believe I posted it if not it'll be posted today I can't remember if, if I had posted it or not <laughs>